All right, let's continue this. <clears throat> Paul used the Torah to manipulate people. And this is a classic case of a cult leader type mentality of just saying what you want to hear. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is something used car salesmen use to hook you. Right? They grab you with the appeal to your desires. So both to speak against the commandments of Yah and to pervert them for his own dishonest gain. In case you're wondering, Yah didn't have Moses record the law of protecting oxen for Paul or his compatriots. He had it recorded because he does care about the welfare of all his creation. I've actually seen some Torah observant believers defend Paul here, saying, well, yeah, it was written for our sakes, not the oxen. No. It's written because he cares about everything. Yes, we're at the pinnacle of his creation, but he still writes these commandments in Torah so we know how to care for his creation. This is the spirit of lawlessness, just interpreting Torah to your own desires. Saying that Messiah completed these things for me so I don't need to is lawlessness. It doesn't place you under the law of Christ. It makes you believe Satan's favorite motto. The whole of the law shall be do as thou wilt. What is what, sorry, which is what Paul preaches. Romans 14, 23. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat. And see, he says, if you eat and you have no faith, you're damning yourself. And he goes into this in Corinthians, and then I go into this in a little air. And what he's saying here is exactly what he's saying. That whether or not something is a sin depends on your own conscience, not God. And Paul believed he was God, and he was raising up little gods. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So if I have faith that I can profane the Sabbaths, it means it's not a sin? I guess Chris is right then. And Andy, you know, uh, what they were teaching the Gentiles was, Thou shalt not obey the Ten Commandments. After all, I have faith that the Ten Commandments were abolished, Chris, so I can do as Andy tells me to do, right? Yah does not work like that, however. I can prove Paul was actively teaching this in Corinthians. Do what thou wilt. 1 Corinthians 9, 19-22 For though I be free from all men, yet I have made myself a servant unto all, that I might gain the more. I see what he's saying is, uh, I, Paul, am the ultimate people pleaser. Those used car salesmen have nothing on me. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them under the law as under the law, that I might gain them under the law. So he's saying, you know, the Jews are still under the law, and I'll become under the law for them. But to them that are without the law as without the law. So Paul just said he's lawless. And he knows he did. That's why he added, being not without the law to God, but under the law of Christ. And remember, I warned that no scripture and outside of Paul's heresy says that there is such a thing as the law of Christ. That I might gain them that are without law. How, what do you gain them into? You're gaining them into lawlessness. And this is what we see in the Corinthian church. That a man was sleeping with his mother-in-law. He <laughs> wasn't teaching even what the uh, Jerusalem Council purportedly said the pagans must do to turn from paganism. To abstain from sexual immorality, abstain from things sacrificed to idols, and abstain from blood and from things strangled. But Paul says, you know, uh, my church, I was just told to help the poor in Galatians. But this isn't what we see in the Jerusalem Council. Was, if that was truly what happened, and I have my doubts, what happened was that he was told to give them four commandments and that on the Sabbath they would read from Moses every day, every Sabbath day in the synagogue. And we see this play out in Acts. But what we see in Paul's, churches in his epistles is a spirit of lawlessness and when they are sacrificing to an idol and i'll get to that in a later study here they paul basically defends it 
as well if it doesn't offend your conscience, it's not a sin. He doesn't appeal to Jehovah to the to he doesn't appeal to the Torah that was given to Moses the servant. And he doesn't even appeal to Yeshua, to James and what they said. He just makes up his own rules. And this is what Christianity is under, the spirit of lawlessness, the spirit of blindness. Being all things to all people is a great tactic for sales. And in context, what is Paul talking about? Getting money for preaching the gospel, using the law to justify robbing the churches. How is it that so many are deceived by the slick-talking used car salesman that is the ultimate people-pleaser? To the Jew, I am a Jew. To the Greek, I am a Greek. Didn't Messiah warn the path is narrow and few will find it? That was Paul's broad road message, narrow. Christians are under a delusion. First Corinthians 8, 7. How be it there is not in every man that knowledge that some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. You see, Paul appeals to our conscience as God. Paul tells you that whether the thing sacrificed to an idol defiles you or not depends on your conscience. Your, and the scriptures, the actual scriptures say your conscience or your heart is deceitful above all things and will do anything to avoid obeying Torah. This also does not line up with what James said at the Jerusalem Council. Acts 15.20, but we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, not whether or not it defiles your conscience, to abstain. And this is all Paul had to write, but he spent three chapters of text writing on how if your conscience is weak, you're defiled. And they said, he backpedals a bit in chapter 10 on this. But it, the damage was done, and we could see that in these other passages but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, which we also see in the Corinthian church, from things strangled and from blood. These four things were not to be the stopping point in the conversion of the pagans to the ways of Yah. And I also disagree with the way James handled that. It's not what we see in Torah. Yeshua also never taught this to the Gentiles he talked to. Yehovah in the Torah to his servant Moses says there is one law for the stranger and one for the Jew. So whatever James came up with, we still have to have Torah as our ultimate standard, not the traditions of men. And James says, I conclude, it's my opinion. He doesn't say this is from the mind of God. He says, this is my opinion. And we see Paul took that opinion and ran with it. He became, went even more away from Torah into lawlessness. These four things absolutely were not to be the stopping point. And I want you to focus on that. These were pagans coming into the, the faith. And some of them didn't want to immediately become circumcised. And I think James, in what he thought was wisdom, and in this, it's, again, this is how it's recorded, it's by one witness, by Luke. I Honestly, I question it. I do, because it does come against Torah. That James says that they will not immediately become circumcised. And this is what he's saying in the language he's using. But that these four things should be a starting point. And then as they learn the Sabbath, they learn the ways of Jehovah, they will want to... Be, take part in the full covenant of Jehovah. And I do believe this is why Paul wrote the epistle to the Galatians is because he effectively lost at the Jerusalem council. He wanted to come against circumcision completely. And this is the interpretation Christians have is that Paul is correct and James is teaching the same as Paul. But I don't see that and I question whether or not James actually taught against Torah. Because that's a serious, serious problem. 1 John 5.21 Little children, keep yourselves from idols. 
Amen. And see, this is how simple Paul could have been. Just keep yourself from idolatry. But instead, we see three chapters of him going in circles, causing confusion. And he's, it's because his mind was so warped in lawlessness. Revelation 2.14, but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. And Paul is Balaam. He is the one that put a stumbling block in front of the Greeks and the Jews to take them away from Torah. He is the one that tells you if it's an offer to an idol, their conscious being weak, it's defiled. And Yeshua says, if you eat things sacrificed to idols, you're in danger of losing your soul. And it's no coincidence we also see sexual immorality in these churches. This is how the enemy puts you under the curse. And it's, it's so perfect because he says, that he became the curse for you. You don't have to worry about the curse anymore. It's just like in the garden where Satan tells Eve, did God really say if you eat of it, you shall die? Did God really say if you violate my commandments that you'll be under the curse? And this is what Paul is doing because he's speaking with the forked tongue of the serpent. He's trying to get you to place yourself under the curse because he himself cannot actually curse you. Even though he does do it quite a bit, he cursed Peter and the other apostles calling their gospel accursed twice in Galatians 1. But he actually has no power like Satan has no power to actually curse the chosen people. You have to get yourself in a situation where you violate his commandments and then you're placed under the curse. Then you're bewitched, as Paul projects on his enemy. You will never break free of that as long as you refuse to submit to Jehovah in his ways. If you believe God changed, you got to break free of that. Because God is perfect. His Torah is perfect. 